Welcome back, everybody. We are now towards the very end of the Cold War. Uh, I know it seems like we've been studying it for a long time, but it was a very long conflict. In this segment, we're going to look at how communism collapsed across Eastern Europe. And then on our final segment on the Cold War, we're going to focus on how and why the Soviet Union eventually died in 1991. And now we're going to look at Eastern Europe today. And if you recall, Eastern Europe had been... Um, a place where communism had been basically forced on the people of that region after World War II and had never really fit very well with most Eastern Europeans. Um, and what we have is a situation in which the, the desire for democracy and prosperity was growing among the people across Eastern Europe. And the old hardline communist leaders, frankly, were not interested in reform. They were pushing back against it. And what had kept reforms kind of from from really taking place was the ever-present threat of Soviet intervention. So like they had invaded Hungary in 1956, they had invaded Czechoslovakia in 1968 when both those countries tried to uh, push back against Soviet-style communism, and the message was clear, the Soviets will crush you if you try to do your own thing. We're not going to let you do that. But again, how can the Soviet Union keep all these countries in line? Um, it, they can't do it forever, right? You just, you can't. And we're going to begin by our, our look at Eastern Europe and how communism collapses there by focusing on Poland. Poland. And the story of Poland is going to revolve around two men. In 1979, uh, there was a new pope. His name was Karol Wojtyła, and Wojtyła uh, was from Poland. And when he became uh, the, the, uh, the new pope, he took the name Pope John Paul II. And for, for, for Poles, this was a huge deal to have a Polish Pope, to have a man who, who openly talks about freedom and human rights. Uh, this was just an enormous uh, feeling of, of, of nationalism and pride to have a Pole as Pope. Here is uh, Pope John Paul uh, meeting with Poles in his native country. Uh, you can see clearly <laughs> there's a lot of people who want to see him because he stood for freedom and uh, human rights. By the way, since we're not too far away from Nashville, guys, if you go to Nashville, you will see a very large private Catholic high school named Pope John Paul II after that pope we were just talking about. Now, 1980, the year after uh, Pope John Paul II uh, became Pope, there was a major uh, strike in a port city called Gdansk, which is way up in the northern part of Poland. And there the workers were going on strike because what they demanded is that the government recognize, would recognize their labor union they called Solidarity. Now, Solidarity means you're standing with somebody in unity, in unity, right? Union, unity, solidarity, we're all solid together. Um, but this was a non-communist labor union, so the communist government of Poland said, no, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to have this. Um, and the leader of Solidarity was a man named Lech Wałęsa. Now, Lech Wałęsa had been an electrician by trade, but he had uh, kind of worked his way up through the ranks, and he became the leader of Solidarity, a national hero. And these two men, okay, Pope John Paul II and Lech Wałęsa, became the, really the faces of a new Poland, a new uh, post-communist Poland, at least potentially. So facing this massive strike, the, the communist government does cave in and allow Solidarity to become an official labor union. The Soviet response to this was pretty predictable. They're not going to let Poland, uh, uh, they're not going to let Poland allow uh, Solidarity to be a thing because they feel it's a slippery slope. If you let them have one thing, they'll want another, then another, and before you know it, communism will collapse. So under Soviet pressure and the threat, frankly, of a Soviet invasion of Poland caused the Polish government to ban Solidarity a year after it was uh, allowed. Lech Wałęsa was thrown in prison along with other uh, labor leaders. This leads to further unrest and strikes, which led to the Polish communist government declaring martial law. So now you have the military patrolling the streets, uh, putting curfews in place, limiting people's movement and freedom of expression. Uh, the, the country is beginning to be locked down, basically. Now, that can go on for a little while, but if you let it go on for long term, for a long term, what happens is, of course, it destroys your economy because people are too afraid to go to work or they can't go to work, and turmoil grows. And by April of 1989, 
uh, the leader, the military leader of Poland, once again legalizes solidarity, that labor union that had been legalized and that had been banned. And he also agrees to allow free elections to take place in Poland. Now, think about what a difference nine years makes. In 1980, the, the Soviet Union basically said, hey, you can't do that, Poland. And Poland basically said, okay, no more solidarity. By 1989, Poland is once again allowing solidarity to happen, and the Soviets don't invade, which tells us by 1989, the Soviet Union must be weaker than it was in 1980, and it definitely was. In 1990, those free elections do take place. Uh, the vast majority of people voted for solidarity, and they chose Lech Wałęsa as the first non-communist president that, the, that Poland had had in decades. So now we've got a country that had been communist in Eastern Europe that had basically thrown off the shackles and is no longer communist. That's a big, big deal. By the way, there is Lech Wałęsa, and that is the current queen of Great Britain, Queen Elizabeth II. Now, this doesn't take a genius to figure out. If Poland decides to get rid of communism and they're successful in doing that, then other countries of Eastern Europe are going to be, hey, how do we do that too? How can we get on this? And the next country we're going to focus on is East Germany. Now, we're not going to have time to talk about how communism collapses in every one of these countries in Eastern Europe, but every country will eventually give up on communism. Um, Germany. Germany is a very important country, right? It was right there in the middle of Europe. It was also in the middle of the Cold War. It's the one place where the Iron Curtain was a real wall. Think of the Berlin Wall over here uh, dividing East and West Berlin. Let's talk about what happens with Germany. Uh, just to recap, West Germany was occupied by the Americans, Brits, and French. It was a little island of freedom that the East Germans had basically put a wall around to prevent their people from leaving. And then you had two Germanys, a communist East Germany and a capitalist democratic West Germany. And East Germans could look across, sort of, look across the wall and, and the barriers and so forth and see a West Germany uh, that was incredibly prosperous compared to their own East Germany. Uh, and frankly, there was a lot of jealousy. Like, why can't we have what they have? They're Germans just like us. Why don't we have that prosperity? And, and then in June of 1987, um, Ronald Reagan visits West uh, Berlin, and he goes right in front of the Berlin Wall. There's the Brandenburg Gate in the background. And he challenged uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, to tear down this wall. In other words, tear down the Berlin Wall quick comparison between the two Germanys. Uh, so we have two cars here, both German made. Which one do you suppose is the East German car? Obviously, it's the one at the top, right? We've talked about this. This is capitalism. This is communism. The Trabant was a uh, one of the few well-known East German cars, but compared to West German cars, I mean, it was primitive very primitive. And the East Germans had kind of a love-hate relationship with the Trabant, uh, which led to lots of jokes about the Trabant's uh, many, many, many uh, shortcomings. So I thought I'd share a few of these with you. Now, keep in mind, German humor is not the same thing as American humor, and uh, you may not think these are laugh-out-loud funny, but I think they're kind of funny. So the first one is, how do you make a Trabant go 100 kilometers an hour? How do you make a Trabant go that fast. Well, it's really simple. You push it off a cliff. How do you double the value of a Trabant? Okay, it's simple. You just fill up the tank, right? In other words, the fuel is worth as much as the car. That's their, what they're implying. Why does the Trabant have a heated rear window? It didn't actually have a heated rear window, by the way. Why does it? Well, to keep your hands warm while you're pushing it. And our final, not so funny joke about the Trabant. Why does the Trabant have two exhaust pipes? Well, so you can use it as a wheelbarrow. Okay, German humor. Now, 19, uh, we're getting to the late 1980s now, and the leader of East Germany was a 77 year old guy named Eric Honecker. Uh, he'd been leading this, uh, the East German government for years. He was from the old school. The idea of reforming and changing was just not going to happen under his leadership, and he is just not having that, that call for more freedom. Now, besides prosperity, there are other things East Germans wanted, and the wall really helps clue us in what the other thing was. If you see a wall, 
it's telling you you can't go past that wall, right? And so one of the things East Germans really wanted was the ability to travel freely, right? They want to be able to leave East Germany if they see, foot, uh, see fit. They should be able to leave East Berlin. They should be able to travel the world uh, just like West Germans could. They also, of course, want greater democracy. That makes sense as well. By October of 1989, uh, the East German government was celebrating its 40th anniversary, 40 years of communism. And uh, 40 years is, is about enough, apparently. Huge protests uh, began to break out across East German cities. Um, you can see one of these protests here. I believe this is the city of Leipzig. Uh, there is Eric Honecker being shown as a prisoner in one of these protesters' signs. Uh, if, if, the pro if you say, don't protest, right? You're the leader. You cannot protest. And then the people do this. Clearly, they're not afraid of you any longer, and clearly, you've begun to lose power. And so, Honecker resigns on October 18th, when it was pretty obvious he couldn't continue the protests any longer. And the East German government at this point, it's incredibly shaky, right? And they're thinking, what can we do to restore some stability? What can we do to prevent the all-out destruction and collapse of East Germany? And the thought was that if you allowed um, at least some people to travel outside of East Germany, Right? If you let some East Germans have the ability to travel freely, that might relieve at least enough of the tension and build up anger uh, that things would kind of calm down. The East German government could uh, survive. And so that's what they plan. They, the plan is to let East Germans travel. That's a big deal. Huge deal. Well, the way they carry out this plan, though, is what leads to the dramatic fall of East Germany. So they're having this press conference where they're, they're announcing this plan. You can see the East German officials here. They're announcing this plan. And one of the reporters asks, asks them, uh, asks the, the committee, you know, pretty obvious question, well, well, when does this go into effect? You know, when can we travel freely? This was something that apparently had not been very well thought through. So one of these guys, you can see him right here, begins thumbing through the papers and he's kind of like, he, he, you can tell he's unsure what he's doing. And he decides, he says, well, uh, I, I, I guess it's immediately. Now, if you're in East Germany and you've been told that you can travel outside of East Germany immediately, that's what you're going to want to do. Do it immediately. And so East Germans run to the border checkpoints and they're like, okay, can we leave? Can we travel? The East German border guards didn't really know what to do. They had not been briefed on this because this had been announced in such a, a, a poorly uh, thought out manner and eventually the border guard just kind of like shrugged their shoulders and the people now are traveling they're going through the wall people are dancing on the wall people are trying to break the wall down using you know hammers and picks and whatever this was dramatic think about this november 9th 1989 right if this is if these people tried this on november 8th they would have been arrested if not shot but now they're doing this, and they're doing this freely. I mean, this was a moment. And people, it's kind of like the fall of the Bastille in Paris, right? You, you don't want to leave it standing. You're going to tear this thing down. And so that's what happens. The Berlin Wall just ceases to exist as a real barrier. And by the end of 1989, uh, the East German Communist Party basically uh, ceases to exist. And a lot of Germans are saying, hey, what's the point of even having two Germanys? If there's not a communist East Germany, why not just reunify the Germanys? And that's what takes place in October, October 3rd, 1990. So about a year after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the two Germans, two Germanys rather, are fused into one mo uh, modern German Republic, the Federal Republic of Germany, the one we know today. Now, there was a lot of celebration of the fact that the two Germanys were now one Germany again, but this, this transition has not been easy. This has not been easy to fuse a prosperous, democratic, free West Germany with a poor, behind-the-times, formerly uh, communist dictatorship that was East Germany. How do you put those two things together? And even today, even after... Uh, all these decades now, uh, there's still a lot of economic differences. West Germany still is more prosperous than what had been East Germany. Um, younger people tend to leave Eastern Germany to go to Western Germany. They see you know, there's a better future. So even though this is all one country today, it's still somewhat divided in terms of culture and economics. 
And how to, to fix that is something the Germans have been struggling with now uh, for decades. All right, in our next video, guys, we're going to go to our next country. Uh, it's called Czechoslovakia. You can see it right there. Big name, and we're going to do away with communism there. And then we're going to look at how communism falls in Yugoslavia and Romania. and I'm sorry, just Romania. And that will be the end of our look at communism in Eastern Europe. And then it will be time to look at the Soviet Union collapsing for real.